Welcome to another episode of the Modern Facilities Management Podcast, brought to you by Flowpath. I'm your host, Griffin Hamilton. This is the show where I interview industry experts who share their stories, strategies, and insights into modern day facilities management. From hospitality to commercial real estate and everything in between, we'll learn what it really takes to succeed as a facilities manager. Welcome to another episode of the Modern Facilities Management Podcast. Today, I am pleased to have John Powers join us as our guest. John, how you doing? I just get better all the time, Griffin, thanks. <laughs> well, I appreciate you making the time to connect. And uh, for those that aren't watching or viewing, I'm wearing my Braves World Series champion polo. And I know uh, prior to hitting record, we were talking about our common love for the Braves here in Atlanta. So I know this is gonna be a great conversation. Uh, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you real quick. And uh, beyond you being an avid Braves fan, why don't you tell the audience a little bit more about who you are and how you got into the industry? Sure thing. Yeah, I've been an energy nerd my entire career. Um, I have been a consultant and a software entrepreneur, kind of half and half for the last 30 years in um, the energy markets. And at Extensible Energy, we're just following up on some of the ideas we had many years ago, just trying to bring smarter controls to facilities management. And so some more context here, how long have you specifically been in the energy management space? Yeah, so energy management, probably just these last five years or so, but energy information services before that, energy consulting, um, just anything around how customers use energy and how they make energy related decisions. I've been in for the last 30 years. I actually started my career in the rates department of an electric utility. So I actually know how utilities make rates and love to help customers uh, get around some of the uh, nasty tricks that appear on your bill. Yep. And we're all trying to do the same thing and knock that down as much as we possibly can. And uh, so I, I think talking to you, you are certainly the subject matter expert when it comes to energy and utilities here. So uh, I know those listening are going to be excited to hear what you've got to say. Uh, I imagine over the last few decades, you, it's a lot has changed here in, in the industry specific to utilities and energy. Yeah. What has just been one of the biggest eye-opening changes you've seen or the one thing that's the industry has evolved in from that standpoint? So I'd say more has changed in the last 24 months than in the last 25 years um, because the very, very rapid adoption of renewable resources on the grid has led to both um, some benefits in terms of cleaning up the uh pollution and carbon footprint of the grid, but also some costs on end users and some shifting in how costs are shifted onto um, electricity customers. So you and I pay for kilowatt hours at home, right, on our energy bill, but the businesses we work with actually pay anywhere from 30 to 70% of their bill based not just on how much energy they use, but on when they use it. And that's something that not all customers really appreciate, that shifting energy from minute to minute and hour to hour can have a huge effect on your energy bill. And we try to help customers save by using energy when it's cheaper and cleaner rather than more expensive and dirtier. Interesting. And so is that something that you've seen to be a light bulb moment for a lot of people where they just had no idea and, you know, knowledge is power, right? And no pun intended with energy, but uh, having a lack of knowledge on like the, just the way that their bills are made up or constructed. Well, for sure. Yeah. I mean, again, some of this has been around a long time, but really the changes in the last few years have been to shift more and more of the cost of electricity onto that portion of your bill that's based on when you use it. So there's, there's sort of two things. One is a, a demand charge. So that's the highest 15 minutes of usage in the entire month, and that can be up to half your bill. So imagine um, that you're obeying the, speeding, the speed limit for your whole trip all month long, and then you hit one downhill and you go over the speed limit and there's a cop at the bottom of the hill. 
that's like a demand charge. And the, the cops are your utility and they never miss because the squad car is your electricity meter. And it always will tell them when you went the fastest on your whole trip for the whole month. So demand charges have been rising much faster than energy prices as a whole. And we all know energy prices are rising quite quickly. Uh, the other half of it is just time of use energy rates. It's much more expensive to use energy um, on the grid, say, in the evening between 4 and 9 p.m. than it is when the sun is shining. There's so much solar now or when the wind is blowing in the middle of the night. So middle of the day, middle of the night, power is cheap. Uh, in that 4 to 9 p.m. period, it's very expensive. And so I imagine the occupants of that building have a pretty big impact on that energy consumption and those bills at those high, higher demand hours. Uh, so what, what kind of in- impact can they have? Well, so, I mean, it all, it all depends on what flexible uh, energy user using equipment there is in the building. You know, you don't want to shut off the lights just because the power got a little bit more expensive, right? When you want the lights on, you want them on. But um, stationary batteries or car chargers behind the meter, and in particular, HVAC systems, heating and cooling systems, um, are more flexible. Nobody cares when the compressors run. They only care that it's comfortable inside. And that turns out to be a lot of energy that can be shifted by minutes or hours to um, a, a more economical time of day. Uh, as long as that's done with the proper automation without imposing a burden on either the occupants or the facilities manager, then you can save a lot of money on your bill that way. Interesting. And so uh, I guess going down to the, like I said, the occupants in the building, um, can you, is that more education that you've seen to be successful on? Here's what we need to be doing in order to reduce those costs, because the ideas behind it of, you know, shifting those times and making sure it's still comfortable for everyone that's there but at the end of the day there's still a lot that you can do with the actual occupants in the building correct yeah so it it all depends on on the individuals right but more automation is better than more education because there are many occupants in many buildings that that don't care about energy and it's not their job to care about energy so the facilities manager has a tough job right is they're trying to support a very diverse set of building occupants with um, a million other things on their list of things to do, right? I've never met a facility manager that wasn't either overtaxed or understaffed. And so, so no, we, we actually, um, of course, we provide some education to end customers who want it, but more, we provide the automation that allows you to sort of manage things by exception. And you really only want to be engaged with uh, energy management systems when something is going wrong. The, the idea is to have systems that, um, you know, that give you less work to do, not more. Yeah. And, and you have brought up automation a few times. Yeah. And so I, I think that's a good segue into just different smart technologies that are available or technology for a smart building. Sure. And I, I guess the misconception there, because in my mind, I think of energy and I'm thinking of my you know Nest thermostat where mm-hmm. I could adjust that for my mobile device and I think I'm good to go. But that may not be the full story there. So certainly in commercial buildings, the analogy to Nest, the analogy is a good one, but the equipment is completely different, right? Is that because there are so many zones in a single building all handled by the same HVAC equipment, um, you know, a a simple sort of one dial Nest thermostat doesn't really do you any good. So when I speak of automation, I'm really talking about um, sort of an automated system that's watching all the different zones against all of your energy usage. And that really can't be done manually. There's, it's the sort of thing, it's where artificial intelligence is replacing jobs that aren't being done at all yet. (laughs) So it's great to have a computer watch every zone, make sure it's comfortable and yet be optimizing against the electricity tariff or, or rate that you're on. So, right. We're, we're the automation requires, data to be collected once a minute. We have to know exactly what your energy use is over the entire building, exactly what the temperatures are in every zone, exactly what the state of any battery or car chargers or the rest of them are. 
um, because that's the only way you can optimize the energy spend and comfort in the building. Um, so we're, we're doing a lot more with cloud-based optimization. We're doing a lot more with, with watching everything in the building every minute. And, and we've been talking about singular buildings, but I have to say a lot of the facilities managers we work with are working with portfolios of buildings. And some of them are, are managing buildings with no facilities management staff on site at all. And I have to just scold the BMS industry. The, the legacy systems are just not built well for this. To be able to actually see what a, a hot or cold complaint is being caused by from your desk, 50 miles from a building, and be able to take action to adjust it is a huge savings for all the facility managers we've talked to. So that's, that's like you avoid the diagnostic truck rolls, which are hundreds of dollars at minimum, right? You have to call either a service tech or a controls technician or somebody just to go figure out why they're complaining. And, you know, if you can figure out that uh, the complaint is due to underperforming equipment, you can just schedule the, the repair of the equipment right away instead of having two trips, you have one. And if you figure out that the occupants have just made an error in, in how they are using the thermostats or whatever it is, you can override that from, from your desk. And so, I mean, the, the automation in this business has usually meant you, you put a schedule on a, on a computer that lives in the basement and you hope for the best. And that, that to us is not the automation that's necessary to maintain comfort and control and cost and carbon management, sort of the four C's that we usually talk about. Yeah, and, and something else that I wanted to point out there, because yes, it is additional trip fees and the hourly rates that you're gonna be paying for, but that's also time. Yeah. So not only is it the trip to go out there, there's a gap between that and the resolution at times. That's right. And that gap right there could also lead to, you know, an uncomfortable environment, which leads to a lack of productivity and your employees aren't happy. And so there's a lot of secondary uh, impacts, impact points there um, for you not having that immediate information and data at your fingertips. That's right. And and so the, the more we can do to make the facilities manager the hero here, somebody who solves problems right away, as opposed to finally calling attention to those problems, um, you know, we're, we're working to sort of pull unnecessary trips or unnecessary diagnostic visits or unnecessary alerts and alarms. You know, just we're, we're not trying to lengthen the list of things to do for any of the folks we're working for. We're trying to sort of handle as many of those things with automation as we can and only bring to your attention those that you need to address. And, and you know, that's that's a huge part of the value. Yeah, we talked at first about energy savings, but really um, it's the comfort, control, all the convenience factors that really um, that really help bring value to the facility manager. Yeah, and, and we've touched a lot on heating and air C, right? Beyond that, because your energy portfolio consists of a lot more than just heating yeah. and air, air conditioning, yeah. how else are you tracking that from lighting, for example, or water usage? Right. So, I mean, the, the buildings are changing faster also than they have in many years. When you think of all of the, let's just stick on HVAC for one more minute. You think of all the um, decarbonization initiatives that are going on around the U.S. Forget the the federal government, just the state governments alone have promised electrification of everything in the next decade or two. Well, that's going to vastly change how electricity is used in buildings because you're going to have way more heat pumps and way less gas in buildings. You're going to have all these changes that both operationally and on your utility bill make a huge difference. It could be a benefit or a cost, depending on whether you control them properly. So in addition to that, you know, uh, vehicle electrification is a big deal. Workplace charging of electric vehicles is, has gone from nothing, and I mean nothing, three or four years ago to something 
that we're running into at more and more sites wherever we go. We do some work with auto dealers. They all have to put in car chargers just to get an allocation of electric vehicles to sell. So the, 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 the changes going on in buildings today are also happening very quickly. Building environment's very dynamic. And you have to have something that's monitoring it all the time and adapting and learning from the usage pattern changes to manage your bills. Um, but sure, I mean, beyond that, there's lots of uh, that's lots that can be done with lighting. There's lots can be done with sort of um, one-off energy users with simple on-off switches, just putting those things. Uh, the usage of those things away from the peak times of the day is a big savings as well. So, yeah, it's certainly not an HVAC only system. It's an energy controls system for, you know, commercial buildings. Yeah, and you bring up a good point on how quickly the industry is changing. Right. And although, you know, buildings may be older, that doesn't mean that the technology is required to run them efficiently. That being a key word here uh, is it something that's changing and evolving very quickly so where do you, where does software come in beyond the data collection because there's so mm -hmm. many different parts of the yeah. building and it you know it takes a village right so uh, what else can someone do to embrace these technologies and get out of that mindset of hey we've never done this before if it ain't broke don't fix it and keep right. going the way it's been going right so i mean in the small to medium commercial sector where we concentrate i'd say I think the statistic is 87% have no uh, energy management system beyond the sort of biggest thumb of the guy who, who changed the thermostat last time he walked past it. So going from a dumb building to a smart building with a one day installation is a big deal. And you know, you, that opens up so many other things you can do in the building. It, it lets the, the um, the occupants be more comfortable. It lets you track and report on the uh, carbon footprint of the building, which is a major thrust of a lot of landlords and um, corporate owners that we talk to now. It lets you do all the, um, as you said, data collection, but data collection isn't the same as control. You can collect a lot of data, but what you really want is something that will actually control the building to Make sure that there's not a lot of energy being used when the building is unoccupied. Make sure that the um, folks are comfortable without wasting energy in the middle of the day. Uh, make sure that all the schedules are kept properly without, um, you know, a lot of manual interference. And, you know, again, manage this portfolio like it's a portfolio, not like you have to drive out to each building in order to make any sort of changes. So... I think that the um, the one of the bigger improvements in in moving to a more software oriented um, sort of intelligent learning autonomous control product is that that you're able to um, you know you're you're you don't have to be on site to be able to affect real changes and real improvements in occupant comfort and dollar savings. Yeah, and, and you know that's a great point. And, and looking ahead at where, as you mentioned, we are currently going through a very rapid change in the industry, and it's only going to change that much more frequently. And the reliance of data and technology is only going to be that much more as we continue to look ahead. And on top of the different green initiatives that we've seen here over the last couple of decades that are continuing to be more and more common, uh, and so it very much is you know, a necessity really to have that data, have the technology in place in order to make these decisions. And at the end of the day, we're all trying to reduce costs, that being a huge part of uh, the budget for any facility manager out there. Yeah, and, and sort so, of the, final, the final step is to start using your, your building as an energy asset, right? Because of all the changes I described on the, on the utility grid, you can be, uh, you know, you can make money off of load flexibility and demand response programs with the utility, like they actually will write you a check. And that's something that only buildings that are under um, autonomous predictive control can do without um, imposing a lot of discomfort on the occupants. So if you're able to 
manage and predict how energy will be used over the next several hours. Well, you can respond to a signal from anywhere and that anywhere could include the grid. And then you're not just saving money on your bill, then you're actually earning money from the energy assets in your building. And who said facilities is only a cost center? <laughs> exactly. So what can someone listening today, what steps can they take in order to get to that point? What are very quick wins, would you say, in just reducing uh, their energy costs and, and making the first step into getting to the point where they're you know, generating revenue for the company? Sure. I mean, it, better automation and control of like, identification and control of the flexible loads in the building. So just sort of separating out things that you always want to have on as soon as you need them. Lights are a good example. You, you don't want people turning off your lights just because the price of power went up a few cents. But getting a, getting a handle on what's flexible and what's not and um, informing yourself about the options of what kind of automation is available. Um, you know, we're certainly not the only game in town. We just, uh, you know, we take one approach and you should definitely avail yourself of any uh, other resources in this space. But I would just say, uh, get a hold of what's flexible and what's not, and look at the simplest way to upgrade the existing systems that you have. Because anything that's going to require replacement of HVAC systems is a huge project, whereas anything that requires replacement of thermostats or other control equipment is usually a one day deal. And you can save a lot just by going with automation of what you got rather than ripping out everything you already have. Yeah, certainly makes sense. Well, John, one last question, and I ask everybody this, okay. uh, who or what has had the biggest impact on you and your career? So I'll go all the way back to the start, and I'll say Amory Levins. I'm probably not the only person who's used that name, but Amory Levins was one of the early clear thinkers around the role of energy efficiency in uh, energy markets and how saving energy and using it wisely was smarter than just building another coal plant. And um, so, you know, um, I went to see him uh, give a lecture when I was in college and I read Soft Energy Paths when I was in college and I thought, mm, this guy's onto something. So that, that's an easy one. I'll, I'll go with Amory Levins. Man, that, that was quick, just immediate knee-jerk reaction there. So I clearly had a big impact on uh, yeah. what you've been doing here over the decades. But uh, John, it, it's been an absolute pleasure. I, I really do appreciate you coming on. Uh, looking forward to staying in touch with you and the folks that are interested in, in learning more about what you guys are doing can certainly check out the show notes because I'll have you guys linked there um, that yeah. people can access. But again, thanks for coming on and we'll talk soon. It's been a pleasure, Griffin. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Modern Facilities Management Podcast. Make sure to subscribe for future episodes and follow us on LinkedIn for more facilities management content. 